Hi, I'm Tim Hill with Tan Books. Thanks for joining us for this author interview. The book is The Liturgy of the Land, and one of the co-authors right here, Jason Craig, joining us today. Jason, thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me, Tim. Absolutely. Can you tell us how the, the book came about, The Liturgy of the Land? Sure. Uh, the co-author is a friend of mine, and we were both, um, at the same time in life, sort of working for a Catholic apostolate called Fraternus, um, and part of that apostolate, a part of that apostolate is really helping to mentor, to guide young men, to help men to be good fathers, and, and it's really good work and it's necessary work. But we were asking the question, why is it necessary? Sort of what happened? Why is there a man crisis? Why is there such problem with family? Why is there so much breakdown? Why is and, and uh, I found myself I was in graduate school uh, for theology, and so I'm in these history classes and philosophy classes and theology classes, and when you ask these questions, you inevitably come up against the reality of the industrial revolution and sort of the technological revolution and the sexual revolution and all these revolutions and and what were they revolutions against? What are they revolting against? And it's sort of this old order, this old way of things. And that old way was, although there's lots of forces that predominantly formed by living on the land and the economic reality of most families was to work directly together and to work directly from the land and for uh, their needs. And there's some, uh, you know, accusations of, of us romanticizing that, that era, and there's certainly some hardships, but there's also the reality that the family unit did better when society was revolved around these things, which makes sense because God created man and put him in a garden to work, you know. And uh, so Tommy and I, we, we both decided to move sort of back to the land at the same time. That's about 12 years ago. And... As we're doing it, we're, we're staying in contact. He's in Florida. He becomes a beekeeper. I'm in North Carolina, and I become a, a, a dairy farmer. We still have a, a micro dairy, and he's a commercial beekeeper. So we've got, you know, lands of milk and honey, um, which was the original idea for the book title. It didn't work out, but I think it's better <laughs> now. Um, and we, we've just been in contact with our families because when we started, we had, you know, one, two, and three kids. And now I have eight, and I, he's got... I don't know, five or six or something, I, you know, Catholic friends. And um, um, we were comparing notes and talking this whole time. We've been in communication. And in that time, we've had family or, you know, friends and family that come near us and they want a homestead and, and a lot of them maybe fail. Uh, we've had our own failures, just piles and piles of failures. And we've slowly come to realize that the, the life of homesteading, the life from the land works on a completely different logic. It works on a completely different rhythm a different um just there's completely different forces that shape how you live your life it's it's very different from the, the technological media saturated hustle of suburbia and that was what we realized and the, the shape of the book is sort of if you wanted to either live on, on a homestead if you wanted to live closer to the land or if you even wanted to sort of have the lessons from it at all just recognizing that Whatever we're doing now, there's some there's some deficiency in the way that it um, what it does to the family, particularly in individuals. It's just we're not, and a lot of people like they they immediately point to our material well being. That like how, how can you question our material well being? And say, like, I, yeah, I know manna is very alluring, but at the same time, we're not doing well on almost like every metric possible. And moving back to the land does not solve all those problems, um, but it solves a lot of them. And um, it does so naturally in the way that I think is, is pretty clear if we really look at the, the history and theology of um, how God wanted us to live. There are things he teaches us and wants to teach us that we learn from the land, and there is no other source to learn these lessons, which is, I mean, we act as if we, you know, we all live from the land, right? I mean, you, you live from the land three times a day. It's just what is the nature of, of the relationship you have? Is it, is it distant or is it close? Um, so we've chosen a life that's closer, right? It's, and, and we've in, we intentionally want to be closer, and that the reality of that is it it's a conversion, um, and not just a a life hack or an easy way to escape your cubicle. It's actually a convert, meaning it hurts and it's difficult, and you can't just buy your way into homesteading or choose your way into homesteading. You actually it, a conversion is required, and as we've learned that lesson slowly and difficultly that's difficultly that is how the book sort of took shape 
And as I read the book, it's not necessarily a how-to. It's not necessarily you should do this. To me, it came across as more of just an explanation of the liturgy of the land, what it is and why you, you might feel a certain way about it or how it relates to our, our, our current world. Does that sound fair? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, the, the chapters, I think, I think they're all titled, you know, from, from this to that. Right. Um, and, you know, for example, um, and, and from, from this to that, meaning this where we currently live, I mean, the, we, we took sort of the predominant um, economic model of most families, especially in the United States, which is the suburban model. Um, and the, the fund and people, and then, and then there is the homestead. So what is the difference of, is this just instead of selfies with, you know, cute little puppies, we take selfies with blueberry bushes, you know I mean? What's really the difference? Um, and the fundamental difference is the, I mean, the first difference is that the suburban home is a consuming unit. So you make money. So we, we have needs, right? We have bodies that need to be fed. We have, that need shelter. We have, you know, we need homes, um, these are these are material needs that drive our actions, right? And the way the the predominant economic model that most of us live in now is the suburban model, which is we go somewhere to make money, and we come home to consume those resources. So the home doesn't make anything. You make stuff outside the home, and you consume those things inside the home. The home is just a place of consumption, uh, whereas the the homestead, the home becomes a place of production. Not 100% production, and there's, that's where the book helps you. Hopefully, helps you draw the line. What do you really need in, in, to produce? And, and and we do propose that it's actually the the natural state of the home and the family unit is to not just be together, but to do something together. And that overwhelmingly in history, the 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 family has done much better when it does something together, not just coordinate its calendars for everyone's individual activities. Um, but to actually do a shared work together. And the shared work is the work of the family. So what is that work? Well, it's to feed each other. I mean, that's the, that's the simplest reason um, to homestead is to take care of one another within your home. Um, so it sort of actually removes a lot of choices of how we're going to spend our time and our money. And actually, we're going we're gonna to do it by taking care of one another materially, um, you know, physical, actionable things we're going to do. So all those chapters from here to there – is uh, you're, most of us, if we're in the suburb, you know, they say a fish doesn't know it's in water, right? We're being formed by the water that's around. We don't, know, we don't even know it. And, it. and a lot of people have a desire to live. They want to homestead. I think every family has like an agrarian moment. Maybe we should live on a farm. Wouldn't everything be simpler and better if we just went outside and got the eggs and broccoli was growing out of trees and... Um, that's funny for anyone who knows <laughs> how broccoli's grown. Um, and we, we have that moment, but actually what that takes is a, is a conversion. So the chapters are, you know, as an example, we love, um, we're, we're a hyper-mobile society, and we, we love it. we got to keep our options open. I can, I can get up and leave at any moment, um, which really doesn't work well if you're thinking about homesteading. It doesn't work well for the land for your family, for your community. I mean, even the way we talk about community, we say, we gotta, we gotta plug into a community. And it's just fun, we have this technological lens. So a community, you, um, a, a plug, you plug it in to draw power that you need, and then you unplug it. There's nothing living or permanent about it. It's, it's by definition a temporary draw from a community. Whereas the community that is formed around living from and with and close to the land is much more like roots. Whereas if you remove it, it causes harm to the root, to the soil structure around the root, to the, to the other organisms that depended on the root. So there's this limiting factor of being rooted. And so there's another ex example of a conversion. We don't want to be limited. Well, you, you probably don't want a homestead. It's extremely limiting. It's not a plug. You don't get to plug in and draw power. You actually root down and to where you presume upon, you know, even dying where you're living which a lot of us we even think of our our homes where we live as a as an investment right we're going to live here until we don't and then we'll flip it and we'll buy something bigger because it's bigger or because it's worth more versus staying in the family home because we've got 20 years of soil fertility in the garden and i can't leave that i got i mean i've been working on that you know <laughs> um so yeah it's it we're, we're try very hard not to um 
pile on people that feel the stresses and the tension of living in like the predominant suburban model, uh, like not just like blatantly criticizing something that a lot of us probably can't and won't leave. Um, while at the same time saying, all right, if you, if you feel this, there are ways that you can root down even in that, but that the homestead, if you do, if you are inclined to that, there is a way to do it, you can do it. Um, but it's going to require a conversion. And you start in the introduction just by kind of defining some terms where homestead comes from the old English word. Yeah, I believe it's Hampstead, right? right? And it's um, it's just the place where the home is. I mean, that's the simplest. Um, and, and in America, we have that, the, the language is stuck with us pretty well because of the Homestead Acts. I mean, the, this nation was really built and settled um, by homesteaders. I mean, and those people were not, I mean, Despite accusations, I mean, historically, we know that there's like gold rushes, right? But those empty gold mines are not places of beautiful civilization that we just picture America as a, as a gold mine. Um, when, when you picture small town, you know, very legitimately villages going out. I mean, these are people that came here to put their home there and they intended to stay there. Um, and that's what makes a homestead is that the, the home is actually the center and the purpose of what they're doing there. Excuse me. Um, and the reason we didn't use the word farm is, I mean, for farm for most people is actually is an occupation. It's a job. Um, and that's fair. I mean, that's a good, that's a good work. And obviously there's a connection between living from the land and farming. Um, but, you know, having a farm today does not necessarily mean that the home is the center of your economic activity. Whereas for the homestead, the purpose is predominantly for the sake of the home itself. So you're, um, is what, you know, we like to say you're, you're eating what you can sell instead of selling what you can eat. I mean, that's the purpose. And the, the meaningful work that you're doing as a family is meaningful and, and substantial. It doesn't mean it doesn't have to be your primary income. Um, and in the United States, it was, it was actually somewhat rare. We think of it now as either, either you're farming or you have a real job, right? Like a, um, but actually the homesteader for ever has had, you can, you know, multiple jobs. I mean, those people that are doing a job on the computer in the modern economy and homesteading, you, you absolutely, you can make, and that, that's not um, in contradiction necessarily with having or doing homesteading. So a lot of people feel a tension between those two. And they, they are tense. They work on different uh, wavelengths, different, different bandwidths, what have you. But um, the homestead is a place where the home is at the, the center of it. And what makes a Catholic homestead is that there's a Catholic family in that it seems for a lot of people, it's actually their spiritual life is the, although it's homesteading is very practical, you know, you're going to grow tomatoes to feed your family. The real reason that most people want to do it is actually inspired by their faith. I want to be closer because this work of the tomato is going to bring me closer to my family, my, the land I live on, and therefore, and the ultimate end is God. God himself is the reason I'm homesteading. Yeah, the line that stuck with me in your introduction, connecting life, working in nature, and life in God. Mm -hmm. That concept is very much driven home throughout the book. Uh, why don't we just start in the first chapter? You mentioned they're labeled from one place to another, but it starts with back to the homestead. And that concept of going back that Alan Carlson, someone that uh, you, you've read a lot and uh, has written a lot about the subject, talks about going back. Right. Well, that's a tension. I think we I dealt with that right in the beginning, which people will say, well, you can't go back in time. And the belief behind that is that the loss of of land-based agrarian ways of life that that us losing that and not having that as a predominant cultural force or economic force um, is because of free uh, un, un, unhampered um, or unencumbered economic progress that we have progressed away from the need to toil on the land this is sort of the underlying accusation that to homestead is sort of to romanticize something that our forefathers conquered. So they almost think of it as like going, like the Egyptians go, why are you going to go back to Egypt? Why are you going to go back to the slavery of the homestead? Why are you complaining about your, your, your newfound freedom? Uh, I think that's the undercurrent. And that's just, it's just simply not true. Um, and Alan Carlson, who I re rely on a lot, he's a brilliant American scholar of, of our history that, the suburbanization of the United States, particularly, was um, 
was a, a product of not natural organic economic growth or progress, um, but you know policy and and businesses intending to move the United States from a uh, a nation of households to you know a, a country with a lot of houses, right? Because housing policy is affected by our family, like what we think the family is affects how the housing so you know just small things out in the book that we want to bring out is like um you know there was a time where the loans given for mortgages would have rewarded a multi-generational home that was also a workshop so you would have two or three generations in a home and this is this historically all over the world this is i mean this is still true in many places and happily so not it's not it's not you know, bad. It's, it's multiple generations where the home itself was also a workshop and everyone worked together and, um, and they were near one another, you know, much like probably St. Joseph's workshop would have been with our Lord and our lady. And, and, um, the policy of the United States, actually they, the, the housing authorities stopped giving loans intentionally to homes that were multi-generational and had workspace in them because they wanted houses, not, not households that were economically active they wanted houses and this makes sense i mean it, may, it maybe somebody's for it uh the result is that we, we you know it's the suburbanization that we would like more houses that that are in the consumer-based economy because in the consumer-based economy you're out making money there's there's tax base there's money being spent there's sales taxes there's income taxes um, there's more homes getting there's economic activity right and there's it's sometimes that's hard to argue with but at the same time there's um you know, divorce is good for our economy, right? More houses, more Christmases, more cars, more insurance policies, more lawyers pay, like divorce is good. So if our economic policies and, um, and underlying beliefs are actually harming the family, are we free to question them? The answer is, of course, that the family does well. And the, the other um, person I really, you know, am grateful for is, uh, you know, Robert Nisbet and um, some, some of the classical conservative writers that they pointed out that when the family lost its functionality, its functional bonds, um, it becomes much more difficult to hold it together. When it stops working together, it starts falling apart pretty easily. Um, I believe the phrase you used in the book was they move from institution to companionship. Right, right. So as a, we say we say it all the time. The family is the center. Uh, it's the what? Do we, how do, I mean, how do we put it? It's the foundation of society. The the family is the center of society. The family is, the you know, the foundation of all these things. Except when our kids grow up and they walk out the front door. No, it's not. It's not the center of our life. Um, it's something we as as Catholics have to fight to make the center of our life because it's not this. We're, we're not rewarded. Um, in our society, in our culture. In fact, more and more we're punished. The more we insist on the family being the center of everything, um, that, you know, that might even be at this point defined as some sort of strange prejudice. Um, so in the chapter, can we go back to the land? The, the main argument that we want to make is when someone has the impulse and the desire to homestead, it is not because they want to play dress up like the little house books or that they want to go back in time and escape the pro They don't want to go back to Egypt, right? They're not, that's not what's happening. They don't want to go back to just toil for its own sake. And maybe we have had wonderful economic growth and, and, and technological growth even, but can that be applied to the good of the family? You know, and the answer is yes, it can. When someone wants to homestead, they're not going back in time. They're going back to a philosophical principle or a natural principle, that the natural state and the natural place of the family is the homestead. And the natural activity of the family is to work for the good of the whole and direct production and provision for that family. And that the, the side effect of that is all the wonderful things that we sort of hope for, which is being together and working together and, and having meaningful work together. You pointed out, um, yeah, the line in there or, or the, the thought is the family actually, when it's there predominantly, when the, the purpose of the family unit is to be is companionship to just be there for one another and support one another in their endeavors. I'll, you know, and it even sounds good. I'll support you in whatever you choose and whatever you do is actually very different from any understanding of the family that anyone would have had prior to our time, which is you, you take care of one another. It's not just that you support whatever that other person does. 
uh, or that you, you know, I mean, that can be financial or emotional. Like I'll just give you money to do whatever makes you feel good or I'll make sure that you have a rewarding career. You know, these are all the purposes we had, which kind of sees everyone in the family as a companion that's temporarily united until they're successful, right? I mean, until you reach, like you, we presume upon if you're successful, you leave home. Um, whereas the normal healthy family unit that we actually all long for when we talk about wanting to have a village and wanting to be, have c- close connection and kin and multiple generations in tradition, well, we can't. We can't have that if the family is only at an incubator for uh, you know, people that are just radically pursuing their own success apart from the good of the family. The idea of a work-life balance versus integration, mm-hmm. I think, goes into that as well. And uh, one of the quotes I pulled out of the first chapter here is that Liturgy of the Lamb was written to, quote, point out that this life of integration of work, land, family, leisure, and home should be approached with a truly Catholic lens as well. That is continually reinforced throughout the book. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You nailed it. I don't even have to repeat it. <laughs> Uh, Chapter two, from division of labor to integrated work. So again, that idea of instead of everyone having a job that applies to them individually, it all connects in some way with the homestead. Sure. I mean, the the division of labor is how we have, um, you know, the the amazing amount of production that we do now of just stuff. We just we're really good at making you know, creating things and, and systems. And, and that, I don't mean just our trinkets that are a waste of money, but all, I mean also the, the amazing engineering um, that we've done, the, the specialization in, in medical. There's all sorts of really good things. Um, but the, the fundamental thing is the, the division of labor into, um, you know, by definition, the person who, who does the work, you know, let's just take fathers, for example. We leave the home to give our labor, you know, to another unit of some sort. Another uh, economic force, another, you know, thing, company, group. group. Um, And that might be very good. And there's some of us that ought to do that. Um, But a lot of times the result is dad comes home and the family gets the worst of them. I'm exhausted. I'm done. I've kind of given my – and you want to – it's like you want to like that two hours at the end of the night before bedtime and the rosary hopefully. Like you're trying to like be a good dad. You're like, I'm exhausted and this guy made – you know, it's hard. Um, So we try to balance it out with doing – you know, and so we're, we're at a desk all day. So we might go get a gym membership because we're not moving. And then, well, now my kids, that now they need sports so they can get moving. And then, well, we're all kind of separated. So let's make sure we coordinate a, you know, a family movie night. Well, we can't do that because, you know, Johnny joined the youth group. And, and it's like, okay. So we're, we're, we're constantly sort of spiraling outward and dividing outward so that we feel our you – know, these are all good needs. The problem is when you, when you lay out all the things we do, it's really hard to go, well, that one's not – a good thing. I mean, they're all good, generally. I mean, save for sin and excess and disorder. Um, most of the things that we want to do that pull us apart as a family, they're all good things. School, work, leisure, uh, uh, fitness, um, like all these things are good. Sp- the spiritual life even. Um, you know, someone's going on in this retreat and then that retreat and that, you know. Uh, we're, we're even divided, you know, our generations, you know, dad's at the men's group, kids at the youth group, mom's at the mom's group, right? And it's just like, we're just coordinating all these things. And um, yeah, the, the idea, the philosophy of the homestead, or sort of, not, not even a philosophy as if we've chosen it, the reality that happens on the homestead is if, if um, that, those, all those good things are a centrifugal force, meaning the, more, the better you are at them, the further it pulls you from the family as the center of your life. As an example, say you're an excellent athlete. Um, the better of an athlete you're going to be, the, probably the further from home you're going to go all the way until you get traded, right, into to the next city and you're a pro. Like, I mean, if you come to the end of your excellent athletics, it is away from home. Now, I'm not saying no one can do that. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying the reality is you're on the travel team and, you're, and your money and your time is now spent, pulled away from home. And you come home to rest and to eat and to put your trophies on the wall. And um, That's just the nature of kind of a lot of modern life. It's centrifugal, whereas the work of a homestead is, is centripetal, right? So the, the opposite, it actually forces you back to the center because it must be done. Now, that sounds really great. I mean, a lot of the book is actually... You know, say you say you want to do that, but your whole family doesn't want to do that. Well, 
you can't pull everyone in and everyone's resentful and now I don't want to plant tomatoes and I don't care about your goats and um, you know mom's mushrooms in the woods are rotten anyway and um, but if we can integrate our family right towards that work if we have that work that's shared especially as they as they're they're young and we're formed in that culture it brings us together and all those things become integrated meaning we're not dividing them all up uh, to try to give a, you know everyone their due but we're by the natural work and rhythm of the home, we're actually pulled together into God. And you move to that next step in the next chapter, the rhythm. You just touched on the natural rhythm. Yeah. I mean, um, clocks were originally invented by monks so that they could know exactly when they're supposed to be praying. I, I presume there was some sort of disagreement amongst some monks on whether or not it was time <laughs> for prime or not. You know, uh, it's not time for terse. Don't get terse with me. You know, um, that's a super nerdy Catholic joke, <laughs> if anyone. Um, so the monks invented time to pray. Do any of us feel like we use our clocks, you know, to, are, there, are our clocks dominating us so that we remember to pray or are they just bringing sort of imposing this formula on our, on our life, you know, day in and day out. And the, the reality is our entire days are, are, are completely orchestrated by an industrialized understanding of time, which is we're putting people in the factory we want to squeeze out as much work as possible, which maybe got a little excessive. Okay, so let's give them another Sabbath day, right? Because we were already off on Sunday. Factories were making them work six days a week. You know, hey, God said six days you have to labor, right? But industrialization was so severe on the family that we actually culturally have now accepted two Sabbaths, right? Saturday and Sunday, where, of course, now we've let sports go on both of those days. Um, but Saturday becomes another sa- that, that industrialism was so grueling on the family life that we had to add a day to the weekend, which God, God gave us one day, right? So we've had two. And then during the day, nine to five, that's when the sun's up and, and, and we do all these funny things about, you know, taking an hour off the front of the day and putting it on the beginning and thinking that somehow changes the amount of hours in the day. Um, but we're, we're really, we're just ruled by this clock and, it, and it's exhausting. Um, and the rhythm of the homestead is different. You just, you cannot speed up the clock on a growing fruit tree. You cannot do these things. You're, you, you all of a sudden are stuck and limited by the rhythms and reality of nature, right? As God intended. Um, and this goes really well with the liturgy of the church. I mean, we, so we as a family, we, we try, but the, you know, the, the hymns of the, of the divine office, for example, the traditional hymns of them, they follow the sun, you know, as the sun has, now that the sun has risen, let us suppliants ask of God and, the, you know, and so on and so on. And then uh, in the middle of the day, it talks about now, well, now the sun's up and it's kind of beaten down on us and our pa- and we're kind of wound up and our passions are going. And then at the end of the day, it's the sun is setting and one day our life will too, right? So the, the liturgy sort of actually follows nature much better. Um, the, the hunger of Lent, right? That's actually on, on the, you know, the season of Lent is, and a lot of us go, oh, it's springtime. It feels so happy, like the Easter lilies are blooming. But on a homestead, it's actually, it's beautiful, but it's the hunger months. It's known as the hunger months, at least in the region where I homestead, because um, there, you're starting to get some things out of the ground, maybe, some lettuces, and you can, you can eat dandelions if you're real hungry, but your storehouse is running out, and you don't have much food, and you're waiting. Now, when Easter comes and the grass starts growing, and that's when, you know, the dairy cows, the butter turns yellow. Butter, you know, milk is, butter's not always yellow. That's... I don't know if we explained that in the book. But butter is not always yellow. It's only yellow when, you're eat, when they're eating growing grass. So springtime comes. And, and so the, the logic in the liturgy of the land itself and the work that revolves around that land, it just escapes the drudgery of the time clock. It, it just crushes the clock. Or we could think it really sanctifies the clock where uh, uh, it was Hellar Belloc who said, uh, when noon is Angelus time, the clock is right. You know, that the day can be marked again by prayer. Um, it's not to say that we don't have jobs and work, um, even if we have to leave for that work. I mean, a lot of people can be at home and work from home now or have multiple, you know, I know I know some homesteaders are just part-time college professors and they have seasons of that work, you know, but the predominant season of their house is actually the land and the seasons itself. And they've sort of escaped the uh, the clock. Of course, my, my children, uh, or it's like, it's Saturday. I'm like, we're on a farm, man. Six days you have to labor, just like God said. <laughs> so cows have to be milked. What do you want me to do, turn them off? Yeah, I'm so. sure they love that. Uh, they've, they're, yeah, it's growing on them. 
so you move from the natural rhythms there to uh, maybe even zooming out from artificial to natural is the title of the next chapter and uh, how basic arts are directly connected to the simple life of, of family and home. Uh, I, I found it really interesting just to talk, hearing the explanations of culture and how you how you went into that, how that is associated too with the, the life of, of the liturgy. Right. So... All of us would, I mean, right now we're dominated by uh, AI, right? Artificial intelligence. Um, the, world, the word artificial has come to, I, it, it weirds, it, I'm sorry. Artificial means to us different things now. Some of us think it just means fake, like not authentic. Um, but the root of the word is, you know, like artifact. It's just made by man. I mean, that's just the reality is that it's made by man. Um, the natural world left to itself is not what God intended, Right. If he didn't want man to do anything with the natural world, he wouldn't have created man. He intends for us to do something with nature, and that makes it, by definition, artificial. Right? A, a fire in the hearth is not natural. There's nothing natural about it. It's artificial. Um, but it is artificial in a way that preserves and works with the natural reality right, of nature itself. Um, so a lot of us, when we want to homestead, we are trying to escape what is artificial because if you're surrounded by the artificial, um, the problem with being surrounded with things that only man has made is that you do not learn from things that God has made directly. So there's a reason our Lord's, um, he, he does use, uh, parables of, you know, uh, stewards and, and, of land and estates and things, but he very often is a agricultural or natural, right? Seeds on hard soil and, um, um, you know, fig trees and all, all these things, pruning of, of the grapevines. When we go to the homestead, one of the things we are uh, returning to is a life where we actually can sense and experience the reality of nature itself. The problem if we are in a world completely surrounded by the artificial is that we can lose sight of God much more. And we all know this, this isn't some major insight in the, but we already know this. So, so then what do we do? Where, where can we learn from these things? And it's like, it's just, it's right outside. I mean, th these lessons are there to be learned. And then you take the next step from artificial to natural to artificial economy to natural economy. Right. So, <clears throat> um, Man is an economic, you know, we have economic realities. And I don't mean like in the Marxist sense, like we're all economics, but uh, absolutely economic. I mean, the, the, the father is, you know, our, as St. Paul says, a, a man that doesn't take care of his family is worse than an unbeliever. Well, what do you mean taking care of them? Giving them emotional support or food? Um, my kids prefer food. Yeah, our, my kids prefer food too. I mean, they like the emotional support, but they really, if they're hungry, they want the food. Um, so we do have these, these are natural needs and the way God made the world is it's wonderful. The things we need for our body, they come out of the, the soil, like they grow from the ground. Um, so as wonderful and miraculous as the manna from heaven, it's also, it's, it's always miraculous that these or it's seemingly miraculous that these things come out of the ground. I mean, it's just, I don't know, right now we're, uh, you know, we're, we're, it's springtime when we're recording this and we just planted all this new asparagus. We just planted it and it's six inches high already. Um, and we, we planted it with compost that we made in the last, you know, two years. And, and, it's and all these natural processes are going and it's, it's mind-blowing to me that this is the order of the world, that things are just come up from nature with our tending. Now that asparagus didn't pop up naturally so that's still an act of human culture so there's something artificial about my asparagus bed it does it, i didn't stumble across it in the woods right my homestead though what i'm doing instead of like you know just being pure hunter gather i've made the home the center of reality so i want that asparagus right next to the house so when i want to eat it i can go get it right so that's what the homestead is doing so then we realize but i can't there's only so much food i can grow but my neighbor's growing other things so i, I we have milk cows we have a good number of milk cows and my neighbor's a butcher so we exchange the services of butchering, and he exchanges, and, and they get milk. So that's natural economy. And that doesn't mean just people think, oh, like bartering. Yeah, that's cool. That's how we're going to solve all the money problems is bartering. It's like, okay, I, bartering's great. But money is a helpful tool as well. So we to make that exchange, we can have the vat. That's, and that's artificial economy. Um, so we go into some detail in there, because St. Thomas Aquinas has some pretty severe warnings 
for a society where people are no longer connected at all to the natural economy. So if we're still talking natural and artificial, that the artificial economy is where instead of growing something or making something or serving something directly, and then either from the actual product or service or to the customer, that you become what he calls a, a, a tradesman, a trader, whereas you purchase, you buy and sell. You purchase something lower and, and sell it for higher. And he uh, calls that by artificial economy, meaning there's nothing natural in that process. You have taken the tool of money, but you're now making money from money instead of money from and with the exchange of things directly. Uh, and he says the danger of that is the society will be completely broken apart because when we're not connected to these natural things, we're not connected to these ends, we forget the purpose of them, and then wealth becomes once you start making money from money, there's never enough. Whereas you can you can come to the end of just how many cans of corn you can really can, you know, or we freeze our corn. But there's only so many of these things. You, you come to the end. You know, when you make chairs, you sort of know when the chair is done. But if you just trade in chairs or spatulas or whatever, like whatever it is you're flipping and you lose that connection, the danger is is the sin of avarice, right? The sin of there's just never enough and you're never satisfied. Um, and he, Aquinas agrees with Aristotle on this, that this is a huge danger. If civil society really believes, or society at all, really believes that the family is the center of society, then they, they recognize the great danger if we reward and think only about making money from money, that we actually stop thinking about the things that matter, and we lose our family. And so the both, so Aquinas and Aristotle agree that the, the remedy for an economy like ours, which is just obsessed with GDP. Like we love GDP. It doesn't matter if families are falling apart. Like GDP is our number. Um, and other countries have similar metrics. That is how they measure the health of their country. Um, that the the remedy for that is the family economy. That how is this actually affecting the health of the family? Which brings into it, you know, all sorts of spiritual consider. How's it, how the health of the family does not mean are they fed? Are they sheltered? Are they alive? Because we have a lot of very wealthy and very, very miserable um, people that are living sort of foretastes of hell in their isolation and their loneliness and their, and their vice and their sins. And that's, Aquinas would say, yeah, that's what you get when you have a completely artificial economy not connected to the purpose of economy, which is the, me the original meaning of the Greek word, which is household management. So if you're disconnected from that natural, the natural needs and the natural filling of the needs of your family, the danger of sin is exponential because all of a sudden you're in a world not made by God, but made completely by man. Mm. Yeah, it's fascinating how you go into that. Then you move on from wages to productive property. You really break it down. Uh, anywhere to somewhere is another title where you were talking about, you touched on it earlier about the family farm and how that really used to mean, at least, or maybe it still does, multi-generational and putting in roots as opposed to plugging into the community, you go into that as well. Uh, we, we could talk about this for hours, I know, but I wanted to maybe skip forward a little bit as you, you break down the book and you, you kind of return from where you started, suburbia to the homestead, and then independence to interdependence. I was wondering if you could just touch on that concept. Yeah, well, I guess we, end, we, we begin the book with the, the, the overwhelming sort of accusation or flippant, like whatever, is you're just trying to go back to something that we've progressed beyond, uh, which is not true. But the next one is, well, you just want to isolate yourself from people, and you want to be far away from people. And that, that is the one I will challenge for, forcefully because we live closer to people than we ever have. The, the amount of people we live, um, you know, in, in suburban dwelling, like these neighbors, you see them, if you've been on a plane, and just, oh my gosh, we're just all over. Not to mention in the, the cities where we're literally on top of one another. We're closer to one another than we've ever been, but we're the loneliest people ever as well. So who's really isolating themselves? And this again goes back to the structure of the family that the structure of culture and society altogether. When you have an organic natural family, an organic natural society, meaning they're rooted in these sort of the natural good work of man that God gave us, right? This is you know, the work of the land is the is the primordial call of that God gave us. I mean, that He's presuming that no, not everyone has you know 
not, not everyone has to be doing this, but yeah, many are called to do that. I mean, that, this is our normal, this is n- normal. We can almost presume upon it. Um, the reality of the, why is, why are we so lonely when we're near so many people? It's actually because our, or one of the reasons is that our bonds with one another are based completely on our free choice and our intentionality and our will to to choose and be with one another because it's good to be companions for companionship and support and um, for lack of better words those those soft needs they're important needs but what i mean is they're not the hard needs of helping one another and serving one another and feeding one another and rescuing one another and uh, you know people all the time say well man why, i would love to have barn raisings wouldn't that just they love the idea of the barn raising you know the amish cuz the cuz we see it i mean they the the amish who live sort of you know stuck in time 300 years ago they still have barn raisings and we look at them and go that is good why don't we have barn raisings like well because we have insurance i mean my barn i had a barn burned down why don't we have a barn raising cuz you don't know how and i have insurance <laughs> right that's why we're not doing a barn raising so the suburban model creates isolation because we don't need one another. We're only there because of personal choice and economic, uh, social economic compatibility. There's not multiple generations. It tends to be grouping up of a lot of like nuclear families, relatively of similar household income and makeup and culture, and they go to the same school and stuff. They're not bound by things like tradition, religion, culture, kin, like all the things that we like, we like and we think we like, but we don't. That's not what binds them together. It's just mortgage rates were good, and we all sort of bought in this area, and it was it's close to a good school, and it's near my job. And um, they're not. It's not built on the family tradition where we came from. Where, like it's not built on any of these things. It's, and um, we try to make the choice that we're all close together. So uh, Robin Williams said, you know, loneliness is not being away from people. It's being around people that make you feel lonely. Um, so that compared to the homestead, whereas I, you know, there are days, I mean, just, I I don't want to over mid-size it, but, you know, just last week, it's springtime here, and we're, we're, we we, we own a tractor cooperatively with another homesteader, and we were bringing that tractor back, and we were walking back, and we caught one neighbor who was working on their garden, and we, which was surprising, because he hasn't had a garden in a long time, and it's, you know, we probably time to work that garden up, and we walk up, and my other neighbor's out fixing a lean-to, and he's giving me this dresser, and we walk home, and we're, we're working on the blueberry patch, and somebody comes by, and, and, and we're connected with all these people in very practical, necessary ways. Like, we actually have grown in this tiny little pocket that I've, like, sort of dedicated myself to, and it's because we actually need one another. You know, we, it's not because we chose one another, not because we're like one another, um, not because we like one another, right? It's just, we're just there together. And we, we've grown to need one another. And the community that's growing from that is, is really beautiful. And I realize that's actually really hard to do if it depends completely on your choice. So when people say you're moving to the homestead to get away from people, I'm like, well, first of all, not all homesteads have to be in the country. Second of all, people in the country have souls too. So it's still a living, breathing, real part of society that we can to be free on. And I find that people that work with their hands and work with the land and work in craft, that they actually quite easily have very robust and serious and good and even holy community, whereas it's much tougher when you don't really need one another. Mm-hmm. It's wise words for sure. Um, before we wrap up talking about this book, we have to get to what I see is a part two. Right? Yeah, I think you guys even, Yeah, the, it is discerning ideas and enterprises and you you go through a bunch of different situations and you even rate you put numbers to how difficult things can be and that's right see this all sounds uh, esoteric and lofty we try to get practical that's uh, i want to thank my co-author tommy um thomas van horn um he he's a beekeeper and he's just he's a good he's just good with those kind of things but what we did was we took all right say everything we've talked about in this interview sounds great and you're excited and you're going to start the homestead. Okay, well, slow down. Um, we took the metrics that are sort of the reality of your life, which is, are your kids on board? Is your wife on board? What's your competency? Do you know how to use tools? Uh, what's your income? Do you have a lot of student debt? Do you need to just get back to work and stop dreaming? You know, do, and, and we put those, those discernments where you can kind of you know, go through these together and sort of ask these questions. And we kind of gave you four boxes you're probably going to fit on one of these boxes. You know, 
the full-time homesteader, the backyard hob- hobby gardener, you know, the sideline supplementer. Maybe you're getting a little more serious. And then, like, you know, mom's got a garden in the backyard. Yeah, you know, kind of. So there's four. I don't know if I got those yep, right. But there's that's right. four categories. You're probably going to fit into one of them. Um, and, and this is, you know, if you, if you grew up in, like, sp- you know, uh, playing sports are absolute part of your identity and you want to do share that tradition with your kids. And like, you probably shouldn't live 45 minutes to soccer practice. Right. I mean, you're, and you need to like, just realistically as you're discerning that, because you're going to try to do something good for the family, like homesteading and you're going to hurt the family. Um, because you're just, you're actually, you've actually just intensified the suburban life and given yourself more work to do when you get home from running around all day. Um, and then the second part of the sort of the metric section is that we went through all the things. All right, so what am I going to do? Am I going to get bees, a milk cow, pigs, you know, hogs, which are all like pigs but bigger? Uh, what am I going to do? And we measured all of those based on family economics. So not whether you can make money from them, although we did value barter value, right? So, uh, you know, potatoes are not worth much bartering because they're cheap at the grocery store, but raw milk or honey has high value. So we, 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 um, measure these things based on a household economy, like the economic impact, which not just doesn't make money, but what does it do for the home and what does it demand from you? What's the infrastructure? What's the learning curve? Like, can you do this? And should you do this? Instead of because most homesteaders, us included, they show up and they buy, they just get going way too fast, way too much, and they fail within two years. Um, so after all the philosophy and the conversion, we do get down to the the very brass tacks of what's a reasonable expectation for what you need, what you have, what's a, what's your reality, um, you know, as far as land ownership, do you need to lease land, do you need to just you know borrow some of your neighbor's backyard and. and um, and then what are you actually going to be doing that's going to allow your family to sort of live within those boxes that are reasonable? Uh, so we think of this book not as like there's enough things out there to get you excited and enthused about farming and homesteading. Uh, we didn't want to get people excited and then not have the reality. So we want them excited because of the truth behind it. And then we want to make sure that they're actually discerning. So the big word is not enthusiasm for us, but just helping people discern you know, can they, should they, will they, and what are they going to do? Those kind of questions. Well, it's a fascinating look at, first of all, just the education and philosophy behind the liturgy of the land. And then you get those very practical, you get down to it there at the end in a lot of ways. To me, it's it's really full, multifaceted look at uh, homesteading, where we are in modern society with it as well. Great. Congratulations, man. Thanks, Tim. It's the Liturgy of the Land. He's Jason Craig. Thanks for checking out this author interview here at Tan Book.